Bonsoir à tous. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, allemaal, and welcome in the Palais Vorschone Kunst van Brussel. The leasing that van avond zal plaatsvinden is het resultaat van de samenwerking tussen A plus en Beaux Arts. Toujours soucieuse d'encourager la création d'architecture de qualité, la Fédération de l'industrie cimentière belge Febelsem soutient généreusement notre cycle de conférences internationales depuis maintenant plusieurs années et je tiens à les en remercier. C'est organisé Remomentel de Negende et d'ici van une International Concrete Design Competition, un wet trade pour studentes. Arzel niet om hen te contacteren om hier meer over te weten. Daarnaast bedank ik ook graag de Vlaamse overheid, la région Bruxelles-Capitale, la ville de Bruxelles, la Fédération Wallonie-Bruxelles et bien sûr Beaux-Arts, sans qui nous ne serions pas réunis ici. Ce soir, nous avons la chance d'accueillir pour la deuxième fois au sein du Palais des Beaux-Arts un architecte britannique des plus prolifiques de sa génération. In deze prachtige Henri Le Boeufzaal geef ik hem zo duidelijk het woord om ons zijn projecten te presenteren. Hij ligt ons eveneens zijn benadering van architectuur toe. Deze wil hij verantwoordelijk en toegewijd aan de betrokken gemeenschappen. Dit is zo sinds 1985, datum waarop hij zijn bureau oprichtte in Londen. Ondertussen is deze uitgebreid naar Berlijn, Shanghai en Milaan. Je pourrais bien sûr vous parler entre autres du nombre impressionnant de musées qu'il a construit, dont le Nius Museum de Berlin, de son commissariat de la Biennale d'architecture de Venise en 2012, des nombreux prix qu'il a obtenus et de ce qui rend son architecture innovante et intelligente. But tonight, our guest needs no introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, please now give a warm welcome to Sir David Allen Chipperfield. Thank you very much. That was very dramatic. I felt very... Uh, I don't want to press the wrong things here. Let me try to put this. Well, I'm, I'm shocked. Don't you have something better to do? You could be watching Brexit on uh, <laughs> TV. It's happening now. Um, much more important. Uh, well, thank you very much for coming, and thank you so much for this invitation. Um, as I get older, I find it more difficult to talk about my work, which is strange, because I thought it would get easier. Um, and I think this is for a number of reasons. Uh, firstly, as a young architect, you're very enthusiastic to uh, proselytize your, you know, in a way, convince people of your intellectual credentials and your professional credentials, and hope, hopefully this gets you more work somehow. Um, these events don't get you any more work, so I, I know that, but, um, but you know, there, as a younger architect, you somehow feel like you, you're, you've, you've got to explain yourself, and it's an opportunity, and it's a fantastic opportunity to explain yourself, and I think it's a very good discipline to explain yourself. I think that has to be part of our craft or our skill or actually, uh, you know, the way we relate to, to others. I don't mean to be ungrateful. I'm very, you know, honored that you should come here, but I'm just saying that it's more difficult for me as I get older. And maybe this is just, you know, as we know more, we know less. Um, there is an enthusiasm as a young architect that you think you know everything, and of course, as you get older, you, you, you know less. Um, I think there's another aspect, which is that when you start your practice as an architect, your vision, your destination is 
the next building. Your achievement is defined by the project that's in your hand, that's, that's uh, the next project, the next idea. That doesn't change. On the other hand, as you develop an office and a practice, and as you move in a way from a sort of um, adolescence to middle age, and you, you, you sort of have another responsibility as a practice, which is in a way um, to demonstrate through the collective work, the body of work, um, an approach to architecture. So whereas in the beginning, in a way, you're jumping like from rock to rock, building to building, once you uh, get to a certain point in a practice, I think you have another responsibility, which is um, the responsibility of a stable practice, which is, first of all, to, to secure its stability, but secondly, to define the potential of the profession and not just the importance of our own studio. So, should be moving our way through this. And that's a little bit what I want to talk about to begin with. Uh, I will show some projects, don't worry, I'm going to show four projects, but first I want to talk about uh, the role of practice. What is architectural practice? So, I've said that my discomfort, or not discomfort, but uh, my, the way of talking about architecture, in, in my opinion, for me, has, has changed for two reasons. One is an autobiographical, and the second one is more societal, although I believe that both are intricately related. And that is that, as a profession, I think we've, we have a, a, a crisis of relevance. I think increasingly, we, uh, we are struggling to, uh, to understand how we can contribute. And of course, this relevance is in sharper focus given the challenges that society, uh, given the challenges to society that are in a, in a sharper focus. The profession has been focused on lavish commissions and uh, aesthetically pleasing objects, while as a society, we increasingly and existentially are confronted by issues of environmental sustainability and social inequality. We cannot ignore the need to reposition our profession, and yet how can we do this while we are inevitably embedded, as we all are, in the framework of conventional practice and complicit in its problems as well as its potential contribution. The practice of architecture could be described quite simply as a professional act. When we, bu when we build, we are secured, as is our client, by a contract. This contract defines our duties and responsibilities. However, our role, the role of architecture, is not so simply described. So we have a, a simple professional responsibility, but I think we all know that that doesn't uh, limit or define actually our, our cultural uh, responsibility. However, our role, the role of architecture, is not so simply described. While each project may be the way to realize or investigate ideas and responsibilities, architectural practice requires or should require us to create or confirm our more general ambitions that should direct the, that should direct the individual activities of practice. Here lies the real challenge of our profession. We must address two forces that pull at us. On the one hand, we are expected to act individually and creatively, to show our talents, to demonstrate originality in order to be acknowledged. On the other hand, we must make work that is intelligible to the collective, that must contribute to the good of society.
Despite these apparent responsibilities, we have seen over the last 40 years the role of the profession being isolated and our social engagement being reduced. This process mirrors that of society itself, an increasing emphasis on the individual and a reduction in the importance of the collective. There are always exceptions, thank God, but as a wide generalization, we can, we can say that there has been a gradual reduction in the role of the public sector as a, as a force defining our built environment and a parallel increase in the power and influence of the private sector. Um, some years ago, I was the director of the Venice Biennale, and I tried to uh, address this issue of practice, of what is our responsibility as architects, uh, as a collective uh, profession, not as a group of individuals. It was my <coughs> assertion that both architects and architecture had become obsessed with image and identity, that the market, the architecture market, if you want, um, had encouraged and does encourage everybody to make identifiable uh, objects. I feel that, I mean, I'm often in a room, sometimes after competitions, late at night in a bar with five other competing architects talking about why we all lost the competition or uh, who won the competition. Um, and inevitably, we talk about the same issues. We share the same frustrations. We have the same concerns. So in Common Ground, which was my uh, Biennale thesis, I wanted to, I encouraged architects not to show why they were different from other architects, but why they were similar to other architects. Not what separated us, but what combined us. My sense was that previously the Biennale was like a sort of showroom of talent, that each architect was like uh, a market seller, showing that they are better than the next one. So I wanted to encourage architects to put their guns down, as it were, and uh, to present our profession in a much more coherent way. And secondly, the common ground, not just between us as a profession, but the common ground between us and society, which is maybe an even bigger issue, and that's something I will talk about in a minute more. Um, I insisted that no architect was allowed just to showcase their latest museum, just to showcase their latest project in Abu Dhabi or wherever, just to showcase their talent, but every submission had to deal with an issue about the common, the commonality, things which we share professionally. And this was, I'm not going to go th through this in depth, but um, I was really happy that in the end, just about every architect um, tried to demonstrate how they are connected within something we might call an architectural culture. I even got Zaha, bless her soul, um, may she rest in peace, I even got Zaha to demonstrate her, um, uh, her, her um, debt to people that had taught her and in a way the, the example to her students. So she did a very beautiful room which was full of projects of uh, architects and engineers which she admired her own project and then projects by students and people who had, who had been influenced her, which I felt was a very uh, generous uh, contribution. This uh, project is uh, Herzog and Demeron's uh, room which they, where they showed the designs for the um, Philharmonie in, in Hamburg and they had a few models showing the spaces, but the main um, uh, part of the exhibition 
was all of the press, these are all, if you, if you know about the Hamburg film, I'm sure you know about the scandal of this project, uh, was that it was way over budget, the city was in, in big stress about it, it was a very big argument in Hamburg, um, and big enough to fill thousands of newspaper um, articles. But of course, in the end, uh, the project was built and successful. They wanted to demonstrate, in a way, the dialogue, the difficulty of, show, of building a major project, a major public project, although with uh, private finance. They wanted to show this, the difficulty of um, communicating the ambitions of a project and the politics and the community issues that go behind such a project. So it was a very uh, interesting uh, process. Um, in Britain, we have seen the most explicit, in the most explicit manner, the result of a softening of the planning structure, a reluctance to prescribe and control development and rather see planning as a restricted discussion about singular buildings, rather than setting out a proper city plan. The convention of traditional city planning, urban planning, has not been able to adapt to the desire to encourage private investment, which inevitably pushes against restriction. Planning requires commitment, resource, and political vision. And, you know, this was the view from uh, our office. We've moved office recently, but this was the view from our old office. And in front of us, you know, every day, we see the city developing. We see buildings going up. Um, people will ask me in London, you know, who's living in these buildings? What are they for? Who's, you know, who decides these things? It's this is not the city uh, I imagine. Uh, I can't explain it as an architect. So how do citizens come to terms with this problem? How do, how do you as a Londoner understand what's happened to your city as it changes in front of you? Not out of need. These. Most of these buildings now are apartments. They're not housing people, they're housing investments. This is global money finding a safe home in London. Londoners are not asking for this. Uh, they're not demanding this. These, these are the pressures of investment. So how can we re orientate, re-coordinate uh, economic pressures of the free market and the requirements and the expectations of citizens. In London, it's a, it's a conflict. The tendencies of the market are not towards collective action, but towards efficient and uncomplicated realization. The market doesn't build communities. And if there isn't a vision, then we get planning that is directed towards practicality of investment, not of user or of society. The problem is twofold. Firstly, it moves focus and development into the soft territory of our cities, the easily exploitable, the maximum rewards with the least engagement. This is a harvesting exercise of land value by the private sector. And secondly, the harder territory, the difficult territory of our towns and cities, of our built and social environment, is forgotten and sidelined. Areas that have been left behind, the normal concerns of society, of normal housing, building community, and a sense of place are not in this focus. So, if you don't have planning and you leave it to the market, we get all of these different uh, versions. And at the same time, we get 
places left behind. If you don't know what Brexit's about, and I don't know what Brexit's about, but Brexit is a lot about communities that feel left behind, communities that, uh, who have not benefited from the exploitation of land value, have not benefited from the things which are happening in uh, the uh, parts, of, parts of the world where, where architects and, and, and planners are operating, they are suffering in places where we're not operating. Um, I suppose, again, one of the reasons that uh, I find it increasingly difficult to talk about architecture um, or our work is that I think as an architect you, you, you have to take on, we have to take on, you have to take on um, issues which are not necessarily precisely connected to our daily tasks. We can, you know, in a way I'm sort of, I, I miss the old days of being an architect where you just had to build a building. Um, uh, we now have to really focus ourselves on societal and environmental issues. We have to be able not to protect ourselves in our offices, but we actually have to find a way of operating or at least uh, stepping out of our office and finding ways to regain our societal value and importance. Um, and so I try to do that. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pathetic uh, attempt in a way, but there are a number of things that I've done. So it's something like the Biennale is an attempt. Um, and uh, I will show you another attempt that we're making. Uh, this is another attempt to, as it were, um, do things which I would like to do uh, in, in my office, but actually we are never asked to do this. So I was asked to, uh, by, the, by Rolex to do a mentor program, and I worked with a Swiss architect, a planner called Simon Kretz, and we did a year-long program looking at the conflict, the sort of conflict that I was talking about before, about why, why is our city being planned in ways that no one wants, apart from investors. So this is on the edge. We, we took a, a sort of um, prototype. We, we took an example, an experiment. So this is on the edge of the city of London. Here's the city of London coming here. Uh, this is Brick Lane here. So we're getting to the east end. So you can see the sort of edge of the, the uh, business district and the beginning of the more domestic uh, and more real uh, parts of the East End. This is a project that's been thought about, I think, for more than 10 years. Um, how could you possibly, uh, here's the limits of the site, how could you possibly, with a clean piece of paper, design that? I mean, who would ever see that as a piece of city. There is no excuse. The only excuse is investment. The pressure of investment and the pressures of market. And the only reason that it gets to this point is because the planning process is not in place. So the developers argue that they need to make a certain amount of money. They paid a certain amount of money for the land, which is another problem, and they need this amount of area. And without that, it doesn't work, as if that's a sort of threat to anybody, but that's what the threat is. So we try to understand why, how do you get there? Because, by the way, the reason it's 10 years, because these guys are uh, trying to make it done, to, to make it happen, and everybody around is trying to stop it happening. So you have a conflict, a confrontation, which is just explicit, and it's just a matter of who stops first, you know, who gives up first. 
Um, and in this case, I suspect it will be the community. So how come we can't find a way to um, determine, to mold these concerns of investment? Because there's nothing wrong with investing. I mean, every city wants investment. How can cities get investment, but at the same time, ensure that the investment is shaped towards the community, towards us, towards making a better city. This has no aspirations to make a better city. This, this not, it's not on the menu. It's not part of their... They will use the narrative of saying, of course, they're making public space and they're making green space, but that's not the truth. So we did a, an exercise with students in uh, ETH in Zurich, and we took the same areas, the same uh, square meters, and we tried to see if you started in a different way, whether it was possible, if you use criteria, which was not just the criteria of profit, but the criteria of what do you contribute to the city, how can you make it a new part of the city? Interestingly, 11, 11 students managed to do projects which were surprisingly close to the area, to the financial uh, uh, criteria. But they had started with other criteria as well, and that was, so that was an exercise that was a sort of interesting thing to do. Before I show you the, uh, I'm going to show you four buildings, but I want to show you one more um, exercise, I suppose, that I've been involved in for the last uh, nearly five years. Um, as I say, we could, if we take the last, um, if we take this last project, I could argue that this is uh, an anxiety of an architect. This is an architect saying, uh, why don't we plan better? Can't we make more beautiful cities? Um, but I think there's another aspect which is putting this into much more focus. It's not an aesthetic decision anymore. It's not even an urban planning problem. It's a societal problem. It's why are we building in the ways that we are? Why, given the environmental crisis that we have, and it's not something that's on the horizon anymore, it's with us. Why are we making such stupid projects that don't address, don't even think about those issues? All that's left at the end is to say, well, maybe we minimize the problem through the type of windows we choose. Well, I'm sorry, that is not tackling the problem. Secondly, and just as importantly, we are having a societal crisis of inequality. In London, people can't afford to live in the center of the city anymore. So they are moving out. They are moving way out because land values are going up. So these projects increase the land value. They're not increasing the quality of the city. They're not increasing the quality of life for anybody who lives there. Nobody who lives here is going to go in there. It has nothing to do with increasing quality of life. And it has everything to do with increasing inequality of our society. These are the two existential issues that confront us. And these pro things like this, decisions like this, are part of that problem. And we don't solve it with solar panels. And we don't solve it with Brexit. We don't say to everybody that's, that's been left behind, um, don't worry, we're going out of the European community and everything's going to be good. In the, because that is part of the story. I will get off my uh, hobby horse in a minute and just talk about architecture, but bear with me. It gets a bit better, um, and it will get positive. Um, so parallel to this frustration, um, uh, 27 years ago, uh, well, 30, 32 years ago, I fell in love with my wife. Uh, 27 years ago, I fell in love with a part of Spain called Galicia. And 
as a family, we started spending time there. Galicia, in case you don't know, and I'm happy if you don't, because we don't want anyone going there, um, <laughs> is here. Uh, just in case you feel, that's Britain. It's about to... <laughs> Britain thinks it's that big, by the way. Uh, um, but I think we're, we're sort of the size of Sicily now. Uh, it's a strange drawing, but that's Galicia. That's the region of Galicia. Uh, it sits above Portugal, separated by the, the river, Douro, and the three main cities are La Coruña, Santiago, and Vigo. It has a population of two and a half million people. Uh, it's one of the poorest regions of Spain. 70% of the land is forest. And it, time has left it behind. It sits somewhere between 1978 and 1982. Uh, it's been uh, forgotten. Uh, but there are some uh, enormous advantages. It is extraordinarily beautiful. Um, it has an, a beautiful landscape and a beautiful seascape. It, I'll go back a bit. It, uh, so it has this extraordinary coast full of these flooded valleys. And there is a big economy here to do with fishing, with shellfish, and the fishing economies of processing fish. Uh, the three largest uh, fish processing um, companies are located here. The three largest in, in Spain, and I think even in Europe, are located here. So there's a big fishing economy. The landscape is spectacular. The, the seascape is, is spectacular. Um, it is a sort of paradise from that point of view. It's not a metropolitan area. The cities, the three cities, each only have about 200,000 people, two to 300,000 people each, so there's no great metropolitan um, area. Uh, I was approached by the president uh, a number of years ago to give some advice because one of the, the one of the beautiful things of this area, it's very innocent, uh, it's very unsophisticated. As I said before, the farming is still unindustrialized. It's still, you know, four or five old people picking potatoes and milking cows. And it's extremely famous for its food products because of that, for its fish, but also all of the food products. On the other hand, this um, innocence uh, didn't prepare it for uh, development. So there's been no planning. So while there is probably the most spectacular landscape, there is the most ugly uh, town developments. I mean, ex extremely ugly. There couldn't be more contrast between, and it's a it's famous in Spain. I mean, Galicia is famous for having the ugliest uh, modern buildings in, in, uh, in Spain. Uh, so the, the president asked me whether I could, you know, contribute to this, because I offered to help in some way. Um, and uh, his idea was that I'm an architect and I'm a planner, therefore what I'm going to do is tell them how to build. I guess, you know, uh, to use different types of roof tiles or use different colors or something. Um, but we uh, set up, a, I set up a small foundation, uh, which has been now running for four years. And we've been researching for the last four years about how we could uh, work with this community. And uh, while the tendency has been to this extraordinary place uh, is, is being one of trying to protect. Um, the, the real issue is that young people are leaving as they are in all of the rural areas of Europe. So you, protection in itself isn't going to secure 
the quality of life in this moment. We have to think not so much uh, as environmentalists, but ecologists. We have to think that the balance between, uh, and it, we, we love this photograph, it's extremely romantic and, uh, uh, and um, you know, yes, uh, picturesque, but what you can see is the most beautiful relationship between uh, nature, between architecture, and in a way, the economy, the way people lived and the quality of life. And what we've seen over the last years has been an erosion uh, of the, uh, we've lost the relationship to the water, which was very direct, and we've built pointlessly and in a very haphazard way into the country. Um, the economy is small scale, but the uh, industrialization of certain things, and as everywhere else, the uh, bad traffic planning uh, has destroyed the city. So after a year, I went back to the, to, the, to the president and said, we have to control traffic, we have to keep the quality of water uh, better, uh, we have to encourage young people to stay, we have to stop building on green land, um, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, he was sort of a little bit disappointed because he thought I would have some architectural ideas as opposed to um, vague ideas about uh, society. But what we've done, I'm not going to explain this in, in depth, but for the last four years we've been working a small team of architects, Spanish young architects, who have hardly used the word architecture for four years. I, I apologize to them on a monthly basis that they were trained as architects, but we don't work on architecture, but we work on environment. And uh, it's been a very interesting uh, process to understand that as architects, when we are given the opportunity, and in fact, we took the opportunity and we pay, I pay for it myself, so, so it's not, um, not difficult, but we, you realize that the quality of where we live, I mean, this is the, the I mean, I'm jumping to the end of this particular story very quickly, but what's important and what we've realized here is that People are happy in a poor place, which sounds a very patronizing way of saying it, because of the quality of life which is given by the place itself. Therefore, we feel legitimized to try and help them keep the quality of place, the love that they have of the place, which is based on the land, but as we see the built environment deteriorating, then we are worried that this will affect quality of life. So, a very nice fishing town where, uh, you know, so we have problems like a, a fishing town where there used to be a nice street is destroyed by traffic. Um, the indiscriminate building of, you know, planning and dereliction, the indiscriminate building on green land. And so we've, we've decided to operate in a very different way as architects, not to deal with architecture, but to deal with community, and that's who we've been working with. And of course, we use our architectural tools and our skills to work on that, but looking uh, at all sorts of things, including this is uh, one of the workshops we did, which was to promote, those of you who can read Spanish will see what we were doing. Um, we, uh, we, we brought the community together to discuss new, uh, sustainable crops that could be grown in the water, see, basically seaweed. Um, because if, if, a if a town is empty because the young people are leaving, you can, you can restore the buildings, but if you've lost the community, what's the point? So we realized in such a place that the software and the hardware are, are together. And this is something we have to think about as architects. It's something which I think is very interesting in the uh, conservation discussion now. I'm involved in a number of uh, conversations and events to do with the protection of buildings 
increasingly the protection community is as concerned now as by society and community as it is by the hardware, by buildings. I would say 15 years ago, all the awards for uh, projects which were about protecting buildings were for the facade of a Georgian house, the restoration of a roof on a Gothic building or whatever. Increasingly, they are for buildings which have social purpose. The, the restoration of a train station, an unused train station into a community center, things like this. So I think we have to, as architects and planners, find a better understanding between hardware and software, between community and architecture. Architecture cannot solve anything on itself. Nobody needs architecture. We need architecture to build community. Um, so, very briefly on Galicia, I'm just going to finish this. So, this shows you the, the in a way, tragic uh, transformation from a town where the street was a social space through bad, well, bad traffic planning to the street which is no longer a social space, place, but a divisive place. So, our argument is, what is the point of restoring buildings if you don't tackle these issues. No mayor ever wants to tackle traffic or parking. They said at the beginning, please, you can do anything you want, but please don't discuss parking and traffic. And of course, we said that's the only thing that we think is going to change. So, so we are, I've raised the money now. We, we've just managed to get one and a half million euros out of the local authority and, about, and out of the, the um, regional administration, and we are now uh, planning a, a humanization, as it were, of the traffic, reducing uh, the, 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 the impact of traffic and trying to humanize and, and, uh, and soften this as, as part of a process. I mean, we're not in, I'm not interested in traffic. I'm only interested in the idea of protecting community and protecting quality of, of life. And interestingly, of course, this is totally connected to environmental issues and, and social inequality. We have to think about quality of life as being the basis of everything, and that's what we should be involved in. Uh, and, and so this is the road, the 305, which we're working on. We've now, we started uh, with, uh, this is the project we're now about to do. Now all the other mayors, because we have five mayors on this area, um, the other mayors are now asking us to do similar exercises, so we're doing that. And uh, so here you are. It's very easy to get good press in Galicia. You just have to come from outside. And, um, but again, I would say it's partly to do with leveraging our position as architects. Um, we are now working on a plan, uh, a sort of super municipal plan of uh, public transportation. So we've taken that first act, and we're moving into a second act, which is to plan a uh, clean air electric bus system to, com to commute between all of these areas, so to go to push this project to the next level where we will get um, uh, rid of cars in these towns. So, and interestingly, um, it's only architects that would bother to do this. When I try to get the Minister of Traffic to support us by reducing traffic speeds through the towns, et cetera, et cetera, the technicians would say, why, why would you slow the traffic down? Our, pro our job is to keep traffic flowing. And we said, yeah, but it, it destroys the town. It's not our problem. So it's clearly not a traffic problem, but and yet, who who is going to stand up and say, well, it's a citizen problem? And I think that's where architects can stand up, and that's where we can. And I have to say, this is a soft target in a way, because I wouldn't like to try to do this in London. It would be impossible. Um, but doing it with this community uh, shows you how, how it is possible to think about the way that we 
find more relevance. And it is interesting how uh, a community starts to, I mean, it's, it's frustrating as well. You end up having to sit in town halls with 80 old people persuading them that they're not going to be able to park their car anymore in front of their house, and of course they're all upset. They can't cross the road, so they're upset with the traffic, but as soon as they're in their car, they're upset that they can't drive their car. So, um, these these uh, issues are things which we could contribute to as architects, as, as people that interest in environment, and I think this is something which I think is a very important part of the challenge in front of us, which is linking together quality of life and quality of environment, and accepting that this is a sort of discussion of ecology. Okay, now I'm going to just talk about some projects, but I'm going to try and um, see if there's some relationship between these, these anxieties um, uh, and concerns I have as a, as a practicing architect. Of course, I'd like to imagine that every aspect of our practice is embedded with the same sorts of contributions uh, and concerns and let's say generosity as the other projects but of course um, they're not and let me also be very clear about another thing um, while we we and you i mean looking at a younger generation which i think is probably the po the, the majority of people in this room um, while you are going to have to deal in a very genuine way with um, these issues, we shouldn't underestimate the simple power of architecture itself. You know, I wouldn't want us to imagine that we abandon uh, our own territory because nobody else is going to it. And architecture, the making of good buildings, the making, uh, you, you know, the, the, our actual craft um, is not invalidated by these larger concerns. I think anything, you know, anything but. Architecture is still, you know, what we do. I suppose what I'm saying is not that we should uh, abandon the poetics of architecture in any way anymore. We should abandon, uh, you know, other uh, things given the scale of crisis, that's not the issue. If anything, we need it more than ever. But we should, as it were, see how this can be better applied, not to, just to the exploitation of land values, of building office buildings, of building expensive hotels, et cetera, et cetera, which I'm not against, but as long as this is positioned in a bigger view of what society is. So I will just now just talk about four projects. And the first project is the work we did in Berlin on the Neues Museum. <coughs> and again, I, I, I want to talk about this project much more as an act of collaboration. To, I mean, I'm very proud of it as a piece of architecture. But I'm also interested in it and proud of it as a uh, piece of, of collective action. And why do I say that? The building, this is the museum island. Uh, the Schloss is being built here. The old castle is being built here now. This is uh, Schinkel's Alters Museum, the great, uh, in a way, the first great public museum. Uh, here's the National Gallery, the old National Gallery, Noyes Museum, the Pergamon, Boda Museum. Here's the Spray, and here's the canal. So this is a sort of island, uh, very much East Berlin, when it was divided, West Berlin is over here. Um, and the buildings of the museum island were all bombed during the war. They were all rebuilt except for this, the Neues Museum. And the Neues Museum stayed as a ruin uh, until 19, and, well, until the war fell down, it all came down in 1989. And then uh, there was a competition in 1994, and then a second competition. 1997, at which we won. So this building had sat as a ruin for uh, 60 years. So it had been a ruin nearly as long as it had been a building. And time, it was not only the bombs and the fire which ruined it, but also then 60 years of weather and uh, snow and all sorts of things. 
it was, the destruction was substantial. Um, I want to come back to that instead. Uh, okay, I've got some, got a, okay, I don't have quite the right images, but the, I decided that we should, given that this building had, was the last, in a way, the last uh, unrestored uh, and unrebuilt uh, bombed public building of Berlin, that to lose the quality that it had somehow accumulated over these 60 years, the sort of strangely poetic Pompeian quality that it had, it had somehow had, had a certain sort of dignity as a ruin. And as architects, you know that phase in a building where sometimes before a building is finished, it's sort of more interesting than when all the stuff goes on the top of it. You know, when you see a, a concrete frame, sometimes it's better than the office building that finally arrives. It's the same with destruction. Uh, a semi-ruined building is very powerful because you see the, the muscle, the, the structure, the, the, the stuff. It doesn't have the slick uh, surface. Um, so we won the competition on the basis that I proposed that we would not rebuild it to imitate what was lost. Uh, mostly because I didn't want to ruin what had survived. I didn't want to damage what had survived, but also we wanted to avoid a sort of copy. So the thesis was protect everything which had survived and rather like a sort of Greek vase, you, you complete it somehow, but you never imitate the fabric that's been lost. It was a, because it was so important uh, within the community of Berlin, to Berlin citizens, it was a highly um, debated uh, proposal. I mean, there was a huge uh, conflict about it. And this was a pamphlet that was used to try to promote um, uh, an act of parliament to stop it. So this was how the building used to be. I mean, this is how the, the staircase used to be. You saw how it was after the war. In fact, it was even worse than this later. Uh, and they showed, this is, you know, this is, uh, this is what it was, this is what Chipperfield wants to do. What would you prefer, this one or this one? Well, that's a slightly unfair question. Um, you know, even I would say that one. Uh, but that one doesn't exist anymore. So I had to try to explain uh, to the question, continuously to the question, in a very violent way often, why can't we just have our building back? Um, which is not such an easy uh, um, question. But what happened was that we, it took, it was a, it was a 12 year project in the end, five years of planning, um, and it was a very um, discussed project, it had to be. And I had to explain, and I had to bring people along and we had to engage with the head of conservation uh, of, of the city, uh, with the museum directors, with the head of the foundation, with politicians, and, and to, to really make this a, a shared discussion where we, um, as it were, led the, this process. And despite the tension uh, and protests we had, um, we, f we, we managed to do it, and this was, the, um, this was the soft opening where people queued for six hours to, so there are 10,000 people standing in a, in a snake, queuing up to go and see it, and then all the happy faces because they afterwards they didn't dislike it quite as much as they thought they might. Um, and then it became, you know, I mean, again, that shows you, you know, enormous um, press always about it. But <clears throat> I would say the, the fascination was that the way that, that while it was a very controversial way of doing things, so, you know, 
why doesn't he just plaster this? Why do you keep, you know, because this is completely new. We lost this whole wing. This is partly new. Um, it's a very contrived process of restoration. It's much more like a piece of archaeology. You know, if you have a broken piece of archaeology, you don't repair it as if nothing had happened to it. You try to um, stabilize it, you clean it, you stabilize it, you try and protect it. Of course, a building has to be waterproof and it has to have air conditioning and it has to have staircases, it has to have fire escapes, it has to air... So it's a much more complicated thing than repairing a vase. But simply that was the strategy. And, and um, this shows you the process that we went through. So here's um, a r ruined space we had to do tests on the columns because we wanted all the columns to become used again structurally. You can see that there are some existing uh, pot clay, uh, clay pot domes. You can see there's some decoration still. A whole piece of the building, the whole um, uh, northeast corner, totally, uh, sorry, southeast corner, totally missing. Then you, we sort of gradually uh, sort of find a way back and find, find a new room in, out of the old. Now, to, to manage that is not something that you do on a drawing board or a, a series of decisions you make yourself. This was the most, you can imagine, in a public German project that the process of approval that this had to go through and therefore, the collaboration that was required, the trust that was required to be able to um, make, rep make a project which was not a picture. There was, we never had an image of this project. We never did a, rendered, a rendering. Uh, no one knew what it was going to look like. Therefore, it was a, it was a journey of trust. And it did force us me especially in terms of the public, um, our team in terms of the, um, the rest of the professional team, to engage and to make this a shared project and to make sure that the decisions that we made were well understood by everybody, otherwise they wouldn't be able to be done. So, you know, to, to achieve a sort of repair where you don't repair everything but you soften damage was incredibly complicated, but it required, I think, you know, I think the, 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 the point I'm trying to make, I suppose, is, is another aspect that I think architecture is not just a formal question, it's not a matter of, um, you know, of course, I would say, you know, I hope, and I think it is, I think it's a very beautiful project. I mean, aesthetically, it's incredibly pleasing and people were rather surprised that something which was supposed to be in their worst imagination uh, and a, uh, a homage to ruin, a homage to damage, actually is exceptionally beautiful because uh, ruins can be beautiful. I, I don't underestimate at all the search for beauty, but I also think that we have a search for meaning as well, and that requires us to find common language, common ideas, and shared concerns. I'm now just going to go through four projects very quickly, I promise, because we're, I'm, I'm overrunning. But as an expansion of, or an extension of uh, the Noise Museum project, we were appointed to be master planner, and we did a master plan for the whole museum and how this complex of buildings would be regarded together. That required a new building here because the original concept of the competition was noise museum would be a sort of, because um, it's a ruin, it would have a lot of opportunity to have um, restaurants and lecture halls and things. And we insisted that this wasn't possible, so we had to find another place. So uh, a site came here. We, this, was, this was a building by Schinkel, which this is before the war. This is the south side, uh, sorry, the west side of Neues Museum before the war. Here's Alters, Schinkel's Alters building, and Schinkel built the warehouses down here. This is before, I think this is before Pergamon, or just while Pergamon's being built. 
<coughs> um, we did a number of formal studies to try to see whether a uh, infrastructure building would fit there. We, it was a really uncomfortable thing because what is it? Is it another museum? It actually has to become an entrance, it has to connect into the Pergamon, it has to connect into the lower levels of the noise museum. And we tried all sorts of formalistic uh, shapes and to be fair, it wasn't a proper commission at this point, it was a feasibility. However, there was a sort of uh, negativity about these exercises, people weren't that convinced. Um, and so we, we sort of went backwards. I mean, then when we did get the commission, we, we sort of started again. And the idea was to think about this building not as a museum, but to think about what its real purpose was. And its purpose was as a place, as a social place, uh, as a, an orientation hall for the Museum Ireland. And we, we took inspiration from, <coughs> this is a uh, drawing by Schinkel, of the Alters Museum. You're on the balcony looking out. Here's the Lustgarten, here's the castle. And these people are inside a building, and yet they haven't gone through a door. So there is this idea of uh, space held by a building, but yet it's somehow public. And this was a sort of extraordinary quality, in my opinion, of this building. And you have to think that this is nearly one of the first public museums. So this idea of um, uh, creating a threshold with architecture but not with enclosure, proper enclosure was something that inspired us and then that led on to the idea of integrating the project with the landscape of the architectural landscape of the museum island, taking the base of the Pergamon through, take the colonnade, of the Noyes Museum through uh, and take this idea of a giant portico as a symbol of publicness and, and collectiveness. This is not a computer image, this is a real photograph, so that's it built. Now it sits on the edge of the river. You can enter it, there's cafes and bookshops and exhibition spaces, there's a auditorium but you can also enter into the Pergamon. You can go downstairs and enter into the, uh, the basement level of all the museums as it will happen. And this shows how the building sort of connects. And of course, it has a sort of formal, we, we were, that shows you how it connects at the basement level through to the Pergamon and to the Noyes Museum. So we, when we completed this building, we, we built this in anticipation of this. Um, and how it sort of sits as a new architecture in this very sensitive, uh, you know, so that, that I'm not talking about this at all, about the language of the architecture and how we dealt with that, but that's clearly another, another important thing. This is another building that we built uh, next to it. So, in fact, these are three buildings. That's the Noise Museum. That's the... Um, uh, Heine Bastian Gallery, which we completed before this, and then this is the uh, James Simon new entrance building. And in a way, it's, it's about making a place as much as it is about being a building. So we gave, a, a, in a way, a, a priority, as much priority to, as in Schinkel, of the idea that, you know, the building creates um, public space around it, and as well as the, so this is the auditorium inside, um, and then these are the spaces inside. So the space inside, of course, is also part of that public offer, but, but the generosity of the building begins outside. Um, Mexico, I'm just, so, I'm sorry, I'll be very quick now. Um, I'm showing three other buildings. So this is a complete change of location. Here we are in, in Mexico in an incredibly dense environment with uh, uh, towers everywhere, 
and a small site for a private museum. The private museum is for a private collector, uh, Eugenio Lopez, it's the Humex collection. Previously, this was uh, in a building outside of the city and he wanted to bring it to the center of the city. This is a development and a project owned by Carlos Slim and Carlos Slim gave my client this piece of land to build a museum on. My client was very anxious that it shouldn't look like a private museum. <clears throat> he was anxious that it should be very uh, public. He was anxious that young people should want to go there uh, and be attracted to it. It should be an offer to young people. It wasn't an exclusive building. And it should, yes, have this sort of publicness. The problem with Mexico City is that public space is not something very easy to manage because it becomes abused. The site was a very complicated one in terms of how we would put a building. And you can see, you know, this is uh, the, another museum, the Samaya, um, uh, um, done by a Mexican architect. Uh, and we're struggling here with this, you know, tiny little building to not look like we're drowning. Um, so, and, and how to deal with the geometry. So these are just iterations of trying to think. So we, it's getting a bit better, I think, you know, sort of, it's got a little bit more punch. Um, and it's starting to stand up better, but it's got no public space. It's just you enter and, you know, you've got to make a decision here to enter an institution. Um, so gradually, then we decided that <coughs> there should be a raised square and that this would be a more generous offer to the public. And, and that while this street is quite famous for everybody just having food trucks and, and uh, food stands here, by being raised, it would stop them, as it were, being able to colonize that. So this was the first idea. The second idea was that museums tend to want to be closed things for very good reasons, but we wanted to try to make the building uh, permeable, visually permeable and physically permeable. So we thought about different ways of <coughs> trying to create that. Um, to hold the, the galleries, the, the, as it were, the protected galleries up here and then try to make the lower levels much more public. And then we had to deal with the issue of top light. It started to change our idea of how do we do a, a top light on a triangular site. I was interested, of course, with the idea of lifting the building. This is Corpus Pavilion Suisse, but they're much better Mexican versions. So we started to think about what about making a space, which is a square, so this is, becomes a public offer, but also if you lift the building up, then everybody can just walk under the building. So this is, uh, we've, we've seen this before in South America, obviously, but <clears throat> given the climate in Mexico, which is completely, in Mexico City, completely benign, um, you can have sort of inside, outside, situations very easily. This shows you now the section uh, with this fantastic room at the top. This is so two levels of gallery and two public floors. And the first public floor is completely open to the, to the square. There you can see it in its place. And there you can see the square, the opening directly into the lobby. And then here there's a performance multifunction space and then two floors of museum. So the space gets used by the museum. They do all sorts of uh, activities and participatory you know, events there, which tries to create this the place. And then this is sort of showing you how. So that's the square, and this is the entrance. And during the day, these huge doors just open. The cafe is under the building, but outside the building. So that's the door, that's one of the doors, that's the other door, so the, the whole ground floor is permeable. So this is an idea of trying to make a private institution into a public place. And in a way, it's, it's part of the discussion about how can architecture, if, if, we've been, if we've been deprived of, increasingly deprived of our ability to participate 
within community, how do we regain that? You know, how do we uh, sub subversively reg regain that and persuade, in the case of the James Simon building, to try to make public space as part of a public building, in this trying to make a uh, private institution part of a public offer. And this was a part of the program that I insisted on was the idea that we should have a room that was sort of multifunctional and sort of wasn't good for anything, but was sort of good for everything. So it, if you try to turn it into a lecture hall, you've got too much anxiety about seating and or acoustics, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a space which is much more uh, visible from outside and then these other normal galleries on the top floor. Um, where is this? Oh uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry, Korea. So, I lost myself for a minute. Um, there, we're getting to the end. I'm getting to the end as well. Um, so, we're going east now. Uh, we were invited to a competition in a huge master plan. Leapskin did the master plan, hundreds of towers, and we were asked to do a tower uh, for a very nice company who had very strong ideas about their, the community of their company. It's a cosmetic company. It's still in, essentially in private ownership. The client is, I would say, one of the nicest clients we've ever had. And while everyone else did towers, we said, a tower never has a community in it because you, you go into the base, there's a lobby, then maybe there's a cafe, and then you get into an elevator and you get out. And then maybe you stick a terrace here somewhere and you say, well, it's wonderful because you can go there. Um, so we said, why don't we make uh, a block? Why don't we just squash the tower down? And it's a 100 meter by 100 meter block. And uh, he, and, that's, and we won the competition with this, uh, to say that you've got much more chance of making a community for your company if you uh, have a bigger fo a footprint and if you can then start to do things in that. So here's the project, there's the ground, uh, there's a huge basement, there's a connection to the subway, <coughs> there's a raised square here, uh, and you know, light from the top, ventilation through. This is, a, this is a wonderful courtyard, and these three levels are all public spaces. So there's an auditorium here, there's a kindergarten, there's a restaurant, there's a canteen for all the staff. So, so this is really like a social um, thing. Of course, <coughs> there was a strong architectural concept as well about this idea of a of a volume, but I would say the engagement with the street and the way that the building could, could then uh, make some offer that was more than a normal tower lobby. Interestingly, Saturdays and Sundays are busier here than during the week because people specifically come here. There's no shopping. There's a small florist here and a small tea shop there's a library, which is sort of open library, not a, not a bookshop library. Um, there is a little museum here. There's a museum, and there's a lecture hall. But on the weekend, it's packed. So it's this company, Amore Pacific, who are, um, in a way, giving this space. So here's a library, but it's a, it's a, you go in there and read. You don't buy books. So incredibly interesting client that was, again, I would say, uh, we managed to work with him to consider what could be the social uh, offer of the building, albeit it's a giant big office building. I mean, there's, there's nothing, but there is a community, which is the people that work in it, and as it tries to offer something to the community around. Um, he, you know, so there are, there's, a, there's a big museum which is, a, is now, there's a Jenny Holzer show at the moment. I mean, it has really international level um, uh, exhibitions. It has this lecture hall, I think it's 500 people. Uh, it is a real um, 
commitment. Okay, last building. Um, this, is, uh, <coughs> this is a very public project. This is a, a, a cemetery in uh, Japan. Uh, and this rather beautiful, uh, it's a private, it's, cemeteries in Japan tend to be owned by temples or privately. This is a private owned cemetery. It's a commercial business. It's an incredibly clever business. Um, and because uh, you always have customers. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the, it's organized in this bamboo forest with a big axis down. It's actually beautifully done. It looks a bit not so well from here. But there was then a, a sort of arrival place and a place where you could, families could just have a cup of tea, a small canteen, and uh, workshops. It was a sort of amenity building. And our client wanted to replace this and make a chapel and make a more proper entrance for this. Uh, so that's the, this is sort of just showing you the topography. And we did all sorts of versions. You can see the idea that, you know, maybe here was the chapel, or here was going to be the offices, and maybe these are meeting spaces and, and whatever. Um, we did lots of different iterations, gradually trying to develop Again, not a building, but uh, a series of buildings making a space and making a sort of place, a sort of way by which people would enter and feel that this was a sort of uh, a way of coming to see their, uh, um, you know, the tomb of their, their parents or whatever. Here, you, again, so you can start to see that <clears throat> we became interested in the relationship between uh, making a number of buildings, one which is a chapel and the other which is more supportive, and a, and a common space in the middle. So we moved to this, and then I was sort of worried that this looked like a religious building and then this looked like a, um, a support building, so then we became more and more interested in, and, and of course, the whole idea is we had to set up this axis, and gradually the project developed in this way, um, acknowledging, I guess, the, the slope. Here's the entrance, and then this is the chapel, this is the canteen, these are private meeting rooms, uh, this is the car park, it's the private offices are here. So it gradually, so the shape, the, the building form started to respond to the topographic issues, trying to get a character out of the building, and it started to develop. I would say in a slightly, I mean, I started my whole career in Japan. My first three buildings were in Japan in 1985 to 92. Um, and it was a very nice experience to go back in the last two or three years to, to work on this. And of course, I'm sort of pulling some Japanese strings here in the sense of, you know, using courtyards and, and framing views and all the things that uh, I love so much when I was working in Japan. And so this is the evolution of, of the project sculpturally and then materially, how we're going to build it. We wanted to build it in monolithically in concrete. Um, it's a poured pink concrete, which is then sandblasted. Uh, it gets a sort of softness, immaculately built. This is the final project with a garden in the middle and the different uh, spaces. And that's the final project, which is, is a building in one hand, it's, it's buildings around the space on the other hand, um, and it's a series of, uh, you know, spatial experiences, which to do with, you know, the architectural experience is just as much made by the buildings as being inside the buildings. And of course, um, the, the materiality, the architecture itself. I mean, forgive me, but I, you know, I'm, I talk less about the hardware. I, in a way, I just presume that the hardware is something that we all love and we do, and that's us. Those are the words that, that we, we write our stories with, but for me, it's always the issue. It's, you know, what are you trying to, to what is the story you're trying to write? So, you know, the idea that this is a sort of, um, uh, but, you know, I would say in the Noise Museum and at least last four projects, without the authority of the architecture, I think the authority of the idea disappears. So these two things are related. Um, without this, you know, exquisite, monolithic 
architecture because we could, one of the reasons we used this was that a lot of the spaces, like the chapel, don't need to be heated. So we could expose a certain sort of rawness of the building. So here's the chapel. So this, none of this, you know, that's an outside wall. This is an inside wall. But um, we, we have some heating on the floor just to take the temperature down, but temperature up, but nothing more. And this sort of shows the. So it's, as I say, it's pulling a little bit on the Japanese uh, um, picturesque, but it's something that's rather beautiful. So just last, bear with me, last few words, um, and then you can escape. Um, so what's my conclusion? Um, you probably you probably got it already, but um, so we we cannot and should not betray our responsibilities to the making of buildings, developing our craft and searching for beauty in the physical and spatial potential of architecture, which is what I've just been trying to say. We cannot abandon our post as no one else will guard it. You know, it's architecture is our territory, and we must, um, you know, concern ourselves with with beauty and the, and the poetry of architecture. Rather, we must regain territory where our perspective is needed, where qualities can be achieved, not surreptitiously or subversively, but through a more committed engagement, through leadership, collaboration, and demanding good governance. We have been educated to expect to contribute and trained to understand the importance of precision and focus within the general aspirations of humanity and civilization. We are not anthropologists or artists. We are not engineers or environmentalists, nor sociologists or politicians. But we can speak with them all, and we can be part of the collaboration. Indeed, we can connect them together in order to confront the crisis in front of us. We need to deal not only with architecture, but with environment. But not only with environment, but with ecology. To ensure that the consequences, consequences of our efforts don't look to future generations, like the misguided indulgence of a civilization so driven by comfort and luxury that it had forgotten, that it had forgotten the importance of community and the real responsibilities that define what we call civilization. Thank you. Sorry, one important thing I've just seen. Yes. Boris Johnson lost the vote. <laughs> Good news. Perfect. So let's celebrate and that's it. <laughs>